This video has been made possible through the support of our museum members. To become a member, visit charlesrivermuseum.org slash join. Please subscribe to follow us here on YouTube and hit like if you enjoyed this video. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's going to go back there to the stand. Okay. You're, you're wired up already. Okay. I'm all set. Yeah. I know you'd rather watch these pictures of the Montana Rockies, but I will go to my presentation now. <clears throat> so I want to thank Dan for that kind uh, introduction, and even more so for his kind invitation uh, to get to talk to you about this. Um, I. Uh, Full disclosure, he mentioned that I had started this Master of Engineering degree and we also have started an online version of a part of it which we've called the Principles of Manufacturing. I'm going to come to an unmitigated advertisement for that at the end um, and force everything to tell you that that's the smartest thing you could ever do, but we'll, we'll see how we get there. But I want to talk about um, something that is a, a reality, a notion, an idea, that um, is honestly driving a lot of activity in the commercial world. We're still struggling with it a little bit in the academic world. <clears throat> and I want to tell you how I think um, what we're doing in our educational programs um, works with this. And, and part of it then, of course, is what is it and how did we get there? So um, what is, uh, and unfortunately our, our style's a little cramped here. I was planning to ask a lot of questions and wait for a lot of answers. But um, if you, you want to do it, just quick shout out the answer and we'll, I'll repeat it. What is Industry 4.0? Hearing nothing, <laughs> <laughs> then I ask the question, what's Industry 3.0? The one after two. That's right, it's the one, it's the lesser one. Okay, then we have this one. What's 2.0? And what's 1.0? Well, we'll get to that. There's actually, the, you know, we, we have different definitions here, but um, uh, you can do a lot of different things here. There's power, there's organization, there's, there's technology. I'm, I'm gonna choose this one, 1.0. Was that? The Industrial Revolution, and you know, part of that came, I'm gonna pick on the one which had to do with interchangeable parts, measurement, and I've put in the, the Springfield Armory because if you read the history of that, that was a combination of the concept of, of interchangeable parts, you know, machine drawings that were references for these things, no more hand filing, and, and one craftsman making an entire rifle. You had people making individual components and different technologies for each of those. And in fact, if you look at that, you found that what was also interesting is the armory was a home for what were essentially independent contractors who came in and ran these machines and made gun stocks and barrels and other things like that. But very, very interesting. Uh, there is a technology 0.0 that I'm gonna show you later. Um, and then there's 2.0. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say industry 2.0? Mass production, yeah, that's the one. So um, I wanna show you that, this lovely film if you haven't seen it. This is a 1936 Chevrolet factory. And I'm gonna show this film twice, uh, but here I just want you to see, yeah, this is mass production, making a lot of the same things. That was a, 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 a chassis assembly line, here's a sheet metal stamping line. Um, one of the things you will notice is there are a lot of people involved, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of stuff flowing through. Um, you know, lots of parts and, and other things going on, okay? So let's, let's take that as 2.0, mass production. Um, we had various forms of power there, but in that, by the 30s, it was primarily uh, electrical. And the moving assembly line and, and all of the people pouring over these cars and struggling with things. And then there's 3.0. Uh, that's good. Yeah, just in time, lean. Um, those actually came later. <laughs> but 3.0, you 
in generally in this, what's leading up to 4.0 in most of the literature, that would be, let's just for lack of a better word, call it automation. Now, if you looked at that Ford, uh, that Chevrolet plant, it kind of looked automated, these arms coming out and riveting that frame together, but we call that mechanized, it was not flexible. This is more the era of uh, flexible automation. And I'm gonna jump ahead actually to the 21st century because Tesla has these beautiful videos. And here's a Tesla factory putting together the, mo the all aluminum Model S. And you know, starting from aluminum, going through uh, uh, the unwinding process using, uh, there's one guy, <laughs> using a laser to cut out the blanks, putting it into the press, and cranking out uh, these, these very precise, difficult to make parts, at, as you'll see here in a second, at a rate of, this one, thing, one every six seconds, okay. So, um, and this, the difference between that, this and that Chevrolet plant that I showed is effectively automation. If you looked really closely, there isn't a whole lot of difference between that press that made this aluminum stamping and the press that made the Chevrolet stamping. Fundamentally, there's a huge difference in the technology that's driving it, that's controlling it, and obviously the robots are doing a lot of the tasks that people were doing. Okay? So, now we get to 4.0. What is 4.0? Uh, I, okay, those are all. So, here, here's my answer. Everybody remember this movie? Yeah, okay. I've got one word for you. Digitalization. I was trying to find one word that kind of captured it, and in my experience, and I actually learned that that's a different word from digitiz digitization, which is the one I grew up with, but it is basically this idea of capturing data everywhere in the organization, having access to that data everywhere in the organization, and using it. Um, in, in simple terms, that's the best that I've been able to come with. And then you'll see, we're gonna have this constellation of technologies that help you do that. <clears throat> but I, I wanted to, to mention something. I have a, 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 one of my most wonderful graduate students uh, graduated, went out and became actually a world famous lean manufacturing consultant. And by the way, I didn't, I didn't know anything about lean manufacturing when I was at MIT, he learned it himself. Went out, became famous, founded a consulting company, um, retired early from all the wealth he gained, uh, went off and did good works, charitable works, got back and said, I have to start getting back into these things and started consulting with local firms near his home in Canada. Uh, and I said to him, uh, his name's Ed Constantine, I said, Ed, um, uh, what do you see when you go out to these companies as 4.0? And he paused and, and he said, Dave, the companies I go and see, these are small, medium manufacturers, he said, um, they've replaced this. This is handwritten cards where you note down production schedules or you might write down, you know, the status of a, of a, um, of a process, a temperature, a pressure, or a a quality exception or something like that, they replaced it with this, with, a, with an iPad. And I thought, well, that's pretty funny, Ed, that's, that's silly. <laughs> and then I thought about this, and here's a little exercise, thought exercise I've gone through. So just think about this. If, if you have the means to do this right now, uh, go for it, but I think, I think that's not necessary. So try this, write something in a notebook. You're writing something on your pad right now, okay? Um, so let me ask you this, not to, not to pick on you, but I'll be picking on myself. Um, you're going to write these notes down, and you're going to tear the sheet off and put it somewhere. Correct. You're going to be able to find it? <laughs> Maybe. And will you be able to read it once you find it? If I don't look at it tonight when I get home, I will. <laughs> right. I'm okay. And, and correct it, it'll be readable. Okay. Perfect. What if I want to see it tomorrow? Worthless. I can't do that? What if somebody in Japan wants to see it tomorrow afternoon? Okay. Like a fax yeah, <laughs> facts. Yeah. <laughs> take, yeah, take a picture and send it through the internet. That's cheating. Um, so I, I thought about this. I was sitting in my office talking to my students. I said, here's 4.0. I'm going to write this down. I can't read it. I'm going to put it on my desk. You already know I won't, I won't be able to find it. But if I type it into my computer or I write it into my phone and I put it into a Google Doc or one of these other 
free cloud-based things. In that instant, in the same time it takes to write on that pad, it's now available with perfect accuracy, it's digitalized, and it's out in the cloud, and within milliseconds, anybody in the world could, could look at it. It doesn't sound that profound, and maybe, maybe we're all used to this, I'm still getting used to this, but it's um, uh, that, think about that in a manufacturing context, the ability to capture information exactly, to be able, the ability to transmit it anywhere from this workstation to that workstation, to everywhere into the plant, to the plant manager, to the entire corporation, to people around the world, to your customers. Um, that's pretty profound. And one of the things that I've learned going into looking at some of these smaller companies is when you talk about there's the technology, the individual technology, which is usually a process or something like that, a material transformation. And then you talk about the whole enterprise. And this has kind of been the sweep of my career, worrying about individual processes and new machines, and then the sweep to, hey, what actually makes money? And I'll get to that question later. Um, there's a huge amount that's going on in this system called a factory, and nobody knows what's going on. Or when you, what you do know that's going on is very sparse information. I went out there, I got a little bit of data here. Um, we know that this always happens that way over there, and I think we're a little bit behind on production there. Our quality's pretty good, but we don't have great records on it because this is where we kept it. Okay, so this ability to have this precision, not just in terms of it being exact, but it being immediate and frequent, is really the backbone of, of what 4.0 is all about. And it's actually fairly new, but I'm gonna kind of make the point that it, it's like everything else, everything that's new is really old. Now I just, I, I threw this up here because um, when I threw this up, I was gonna say, isn't this great? But I think it's actually gonna fit into my punchline. So I was visiting a, a, a nice modern machine shop in Emporia, Kansas this summer. Uh, and uh, let's put it this way, they were, they were making money, they were doing well, but they could not meet their demand. They had a little bit of a quality issue, and most of all, they said, we need to double our space because we can't keep up, and so we need more machines and more people, but we can't afford the space, and unemployment was like a half percent, so there was no way to get people. Uh, and so they bought some technology, and this is what I would call 4.0 Point one. The iPad is point .0. Oh. This is, this is uh, as, as simple as it looks, this is actually pretty cool stuff and really one of the first levels of what we would call 4.0. Each of these squares represents a, a fancy new machine tool and on their shop floor. And this is simply tell you, telling you what's going on on that. And it's on a screen out in the factory that's about the size of this screen right here. They did this and all of a sudden their productivity improved. Because all of a sudden, all the different machinists and the manager of the shop knew exactly what was going on. And in, in a positive way, you know, it was positive reinforcement. So, and I have some students starting a, a machine learning company right now. Actually, they're on leave starting it. And this is the first level. Capture the data and just look at it. So that's, that, you might say that's your first small step on the way to uh, 4.0. And share it. That's the other thing, this is, this is all out there. And by the way, we haven't done anything fancy with it. We're not, we're not, it's being recorded, but we're not trying to model it. We're not trying to do any calculations or we're not doing any artificial intelligence on it. Okay, so that, that's kind of the, that's, that's a technological thing. How did this whole thing of 4.0 come, uh, come about? Um, there are probably a number of different um, stories about this, but I, I had um, uh, one of these students who's now starting the company do a little study on this, and he said, well, actually, it was started by this project that the journal, journal Germany, uh, German Federal Ministry started uh, back in, way back in 2011 uh, uh, that was uh, executed by the German Academy of Engineering Sciences, and, you know, what did it really mean? Well, it meant, Cyber physical systems, I, I, I'm not quite sure I know exactly what that means, but that means basically com computers connected to machines and, and back and forth, which is also what we mean by Internet of Things, 
And by the way, I'm so glad I'm a mechanical engineer because we make things, you know. This, this, this wonderful museum is filled with things and the internet has finally caught up with us. Um, and, then, and then the general idea of smart factories and, and that, that's a term we can uh, bandy about all night. But here's the interesting thing uh, that he found. I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly. So you know, what was the research agenda? And without getting, to, I, I don't wanna to get too technical, but network communication standards. 20, 25 years ago, I was on a visiting committee at the National Institute of Standards and Technologies in their manufacturing lab, where you just come and they talk to you for a couple days. What do you think the biggest issue that they were dealing with those days was? It was this. Lack of standards. Lack of standards. They, you know, everybody was coming out with this automated equipment like I showed you, but this, this, they had this standard. General Motors had their own network standard. It was a mess. <clears throat> so, uh, these guys said, hey, that's, a, that's an issue. And if we're going to start doing all these networks and sharing data, then security of it is an important thing. Um, this one's kind of an interesting one. It keeps coming up. And how do we keep employees current on all this? And I'll, I'll mention that near the end. But here's the one I really like. Democratize the proliferation of technology. So you're supposed to be focusing on small and medium businesses. This was really a movement to um, have all of the, those companies kind of play in the big leagues with all the big companies. Um, uh, actually, the, the slide I wanted is, is coming later, but is a better punchline. But right now, he, let's just say, okay, so the, the idea was to, to really democratize things. So how do we do that? This is now what has evolved as a description. This comes from the Boston Consulting Group, but I think it's gen got some general acceptance that Industry 4.0 is this collection of technologies. The ones I've talked about, you know, um, Internet of Things, cloud computing, meaning, you know, everything's distributed everywhere and everybody can get to it. Big data, and big data has always been there. We just didn't, the ideas behind big data have always been there. We just didn't have big data. Now we do, and I'll explain that in a moment. Augmented reality, system integration, cybersecurity, simulation, nothing new about that, but again, it's becoming ubiquitous. Autonomous robots, we'll see about that. Additive manufacturing, Okay, I, we could talk about that too, but Internet of Things, cloud computing, that sort of thing. I, I kind of think <clears throat> these up here are the real um, game changers. Before I go on though, um, I was asked by some of my colleagues to point out that 4.0, which came out of Germany, um, actually has parallels in a lot of different areas. And, and uh, Dan mentioned this, uh, this uh, program that we did um, back in Washington back in 2011, the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, all about looking at ways of organizing and um, advancing advanced manufacturing uh, technology. So Japan has a program, Korea, and you've heard about the China 2025 probably. So everybody is, is fortunately, and I'm glad to say that Dan was right about the decline of manufacturing, but uh, what was Mark Twain's quote? The, um, the rumors of my death are premature. Um, the interesting thing is, and we had data on this for years, I wish I still had it here. The net value added, uh, manufacturing value added in the United States hasn't really changed almost in, in three or four decades. And until just about, well, and now it's about um, maybe 10 years ago, we also had the highest value added. China has now uh, eclipsed that. But what has changed is the labor content and the productivity. So it's, it's declined as a fraction of our economy, yes, it's declined as a fraction of employment, but it's still a, a huge uh, economic engine. <clears throat> but here's the interesting thing. Now this is back to the democratization. Don't try to read this, but basically these are companies by some rating system in 2016 how far along they were in becoming a 4.0 company. The one at the top is Samsung, way down here is Apple, and everyone in between is a mega corporation. So the point of this is uh, the small and medium guys have kind of been left behind. And that's an that's a issue for another day, 
but it's an important, it's an important point. Okay. Oh yeah, so there's just a little one. 77% of small manufacturers had no Internet of Things penetration in 2016. And an Internet of Thing, that's like what I just showed you. That's your machine tool talking to a, to a screen. Nowadays, that, that shouldn't quite be like that. Okay, so I promised to say how we got here. And we've already talked about this. We did. There was this thing called 1.0 and 2.0 and 3.0, and here, here's my point. All of a sudden, one day we woke up and we were no longer at 3.0, it was 4.0. When was that? And the interesting thing is that, again, looking at this from an academic point of view, it's of course been a slow progression. And when I look back, it just every year, there's a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. So what's the big deal about 4.0? Any takers? <laughs> What's that? Well, yes, thank you very much. That's exactly what it is. It turns out, it, if you wanted to point to one thing, it's Moore's Law. The law that we double the speed of, is it, what is it, the double the speed of semiconductors and number of, number of transistors and double the capability every 18 months or something like that, yeah. Yeah, well, so I have some data on that. So here, here's my point. What's really new about 4.0? Oh, this is the internet, right? We use the internet. Oh, well now we have PCs everywhere. That's what's new. Oh, uh, the web. Yep. It's now we have the web. That's what's new. That's why we got to 4.0. Oh, no, no, it's industrial robots. That's what's really new. Ah, uh, yes, it's Wi-Fi. That's what's really new. <laughs> You see, you see where I'm going with this? Um, oh, it's artificial neural networks. That's the real breakthrough thing. Okay, so, um, and it's, oh, sorry, and it's the Internet of Things. Uh, sorry. It's the Internet of Things. That's all what's new. So I did a little bit of history on this. I could, I could have written some of this myself. But what's new? Okay, the Internet, ARPANET is now 50 years old. That's when we first had the Internet. And, Develop that now, you know, you can argue how much it was involved there But that was when the first communications were done over the thing that what became the internet The IBM PC is over the 40 years old the web Tim Berners-Lee Kind of established that standard and and he not Al Gore, you know came up with the web uh, more than 30 years ago the Wi-Fi wi just Wi-Fi is 23 years old Artificial neural networks, I thought this one was going to be a surprise because I, I actually worked with them a little bit back in the 80s doing some automation work. They were pretty crude. They're actually dated to 1943, the concept. Um, 3D printing, stereolithography, um, 35 years ago. <clears throat> and the last one, Internet of Things, it turns out that was established when a Coke machine was hooked up to a computer at, at Carnegie Mellon University. So these are old technologies, right? 40, 50 years old. What's different? Moore's Law. Moore's Law. Um, now we have, and, and I would say it's even more than Moore's Law. It's Moore's Law, which has made computers faster and cheaper and all these other things. But the other thing is, how many people have a computer? How many people surf the web and do email and things like that? Uh, take pictures. How many people, I don't know how many people do this, I just learned how to do this. How many people use Google Photos and search for a face? Okay, you're using artificial neural networks, you're using gigabyte um, a memory, you're, you're sending stuff around the world faster than you can believe it. How much does it cost you? How much does Google Photos cost you? Zero. How much did your computer cost you? A little bit more than zero. So now you've gotten to the point where, you know, you can get on the web for almost nothing. Um, you can get a, a, a giga something 
computer for $300. You've got the cloud. I, I gave you the, uh, the Google Docs example. That's absolutely free, and yet you can share documents around the world. Um, you've got the cloud. Um, an iPad, the thing you're going to use to digitalize everything, you can pick those up for 100 bucks if you want to get fancy and buy a, uh, a Mac. It's got to be a couple hundred bucks. But it's giga everything <clears throat> for almost zero uh, dollars. Wi-Fi everywhere, you know, it's, it's penetrating everywhere. As I had Google Photos. Anybody have a home 3D printer? And what did it cost you? Yeah, two, three hundred bucks. By the way, one of the big explosions in 3D printing was when we started to do that, even though that's not what's having the impact in industry. They were all bottled up with patents and expensive things, and all of a sudden, people said, hey, I can make these for 300 bucks, and they, they've exploded in interest. And you can buy a Nest thermostat. And a Nest thermostat, you know about the Nest thermostats? These are the ones that talk to the, to the Wi-Fi. Or you can turn your lights on and off with your iPhone. Welcome to Internet of Things. Okay, so what happened in that 40 to 50 years is the cost reduction is a thousand plus times in computers, sensors, and wireless networks. That number's actually very wrong. I'm gonna show you in just a second. The speed increase, in other words, the speed of computing is enormous, uh, enormous changes on that. Easily a thousand times, maybe 10,000 times, or, or many orders of magnitude. You know, you've heard about the memory thing. I love to tell my students about the first computer I worked on, which was a little desktop thing from digital equipment, and it had 8,000 bytes of memory in it. 8,000, you know? <laughs> they can't believe it. And I said it cost $10,000. Um, and what I think is really important here is this consumer-friendly ability. That's why I was asking, we all can use this stuff. And we don't have PhDs in, in computer science or network science. Uh, it's been made very, very easy. So things have plummeted in cost. These are the classic things. Oh, and industrial robots have come down tremendously in cost. Um, this is the one I like. Cost of gigaflops, the speed of a, of a computer. Um, back here in, in 1980 to get 100 gigaflops. So that would be like a supercomputer. I looked this up. There's a table in this. $42 million. Now, down here, that same, that same cost per gigaflop is three cents. So I call that prohibitive, and the other one is free. <laughs> You're talking about hardware costs, but the other costs have become much more significant. You're talking about software. Software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Management. Exactly. And, and, that's, and that's exactly why. In fact, I think we had the hardware before we kind of caught up because this approach to what we call universal, you know, for example, a lot of the standards we're using now have been sort of organically developed. And, you know, we haven't waited for NIST to come up with standards and other things. Um, and this, this consumer friendly part has still not penetrated into industry as much as, as I think it should. But it's also, I think, the key to this problem, as I said, of democratizing things. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. And I can't, probably you're right, because we've gone from, from when we had 8K of memory, our programs also had a few thousand lines of code, and now they have ridiculous numbers. And storage, same thing. OK. So what? So we have all these technology stories. Um, and I've been pushing more the information side of it, you know, knowing what's going on. There are these new technologies like additive manufacturing, autonomous robots. They're on a continuum. Additive manufacturing, in my opinion, has just kind of turned the road from being uh, still kind of a, a, an interesting way of doing a prototype or making a specialty part. Um, you know, for example, BMW came by and said, we just want, or sorry, it was GM said, we just want to be able to be able to say we 3D, 3D printed a part for one of our Cadillacs, you know, something like that, but to actually use it in production. But then you start to see things like General Electric saying, we can make a part for a jet engine that will have tremendous improvement and performance of the engine that we couldn't make any other way. It will eliminate 
uh, 20, 30 other processes and operations and the supply chains that go with them and on and on and on. So it's, and it will work, the engine will work. And now uh, what I found, uh, just learned some of this stuff recently is that it's allowing you not just, you think of a 3D printer as something that moves around and makes a 3D shape, isn't that cool? Um, and you generally don't care what it's made of, but now to make functional parts, that's extremely important. And people are exploiting this technology to just not do that, but to actually, you're making the part and the material at the same time. So you can actually custom make the material. You can change its properties, um, uh, uh, have mixtures and all types of things like that, even to the point where uh, talking to some, some people in the national labs are talking about being able to make, again, make parts and materials that you can't make any other way. You can only make them by printing them point by point. So uh, more to be heard on uh, additive manufacturing. One thing additive manufacturing will never do is make body parts like that Tesla factory as fast as it's making them. So it's, it's a new, wonderful new technology to make things uh, that we haven't been able to so far. And it's opening up a lot of design space. So I've talked about all this other stuff. Now I want to talk about manufacturing. And the first thing I want to do is, is, is sort of ask the group, what is manufacturing? That's right, making something from something else. Something, something of value. Converting a collection of small and potentially less valued things into something more higher order and more valuable. This is great. You guys are even more abstract than we are at MIT. That's really, <laughs> this is great. You're not giving me the answer I wanted. You're giving me the right answer. Yeah. Adding value. Yeah, it's adding value. You're, you're all right. OK. So what you're supposed to say, oh, it's, it's robots and machine tools and, and, and ion etching machines and, in other words, and additive manufacturing machines and that sort of thing. It's all these cool technologies. And um, I would say, yes, those are tiny little pieces of the whole thing that come together to add value, to convert material and other things like that. So um, <clears throat> this, is, I, this is my segue into defining for you um, what we call the principles of manufacturing. And it is to say what's, what's unique about the enterprise of manufacturing that you don't find any other place. And if this works, I'll be happy. So these are the videos you've already seen. And this one up here, this is industry 0.0. And by the way, this is the oldest video. This is the second oldest video, and this is from January. <laughs> and what you see here, of course, you see the assembly plant going on here. You see the body stamping here. What you'll see here is a gentleman um, weaving a rough cloth called coir made from uh, the, the fiber from a coconut shell. And it's a very popular utility fabric um, around the world. It's like, like um, sisal or something like that and, and woven. But it's made into mats that they're used, they're used in particular in India, India, and that's where that was, is to, to control erosion and other things like that. They also make some decorative things. And you can buy placemats at your local um, store with rubber on the bottom and they'll have car on the top and we saw those being made in the same factory. Okay, completely different factories, right? And uh, the different centuries here. What's the same in all of these that, that really kind of says, oh, that's manufacturing? Assembly? Making, <laughs> good, now you're playing right into me, thanks. <laughs> yeah, assembly, okay. Transition, yep, things, things, yep. They're machines. They're, they're, well, sort of. There was, there, that's right, they had a loom, yeah, yeah. By the way, a little side story, as we were touring that place, over in the corner was a bona fide, I'd say 20th century uh, automatic loom, just covered in dirt and everything like that. Nobody was using it. <laughs> Too hard to maintain. Um, so. That's the real, the real question is to, to get 
to, to this. What's common about all of these and what's different? Well, we know it was different, right? The technology was different. We went from hand-powered looms to mechanized um, <clears throat> assembly machines and stamping machines with a lot of labor intensity to full automation with everybody just kind of standing back. Um, so that's those sort of steps of technology that we've been talking about, 1.0, 2.0. But what was the same in all of them? Just looking at the picture. They're each producing something. How many th somethings? We would agree it's more than one. It's more than a few. And what I, what I wanted those videos to really get across, and I don't know if I can get them to run again. Let me see if this works. This one in particular is a great one. But, um, and the, the, the textile one is too. There's stuff moving all the time. One, have you ever been into a factory when you didn't see stuff moving? And you know, there is this, 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 you know, the famous movies of the old River Rouge plant, you know, coal and, and steel and, and iron ore and raw rubber coming in and cars coming out the other side and just continually flowing. So there's a continual flow of material through these technologies to produce that part. And they're making a lot of each one. And each time you make a new part here, each time they stamp that, each time they assemble something with a robot, every time that guy throws the shuttlecock across, what is it an opportunity to do? Make a mistake, exactly. And you will. And anybody who's ever done this, made more than one thing, make something, be as careful as you can with your brown and sharp lathe, you know, and take that micrometer out. Is everyone going to be the same? Yeah, not if you have a good micrometer. So, <clears throat> so, you know, and, and you even know, even certainly back in the day here, but even, even with a modern computer assembled car, a Tesla, there is variation, okay? So, um, what we've really kind of said is, is backing up, and I, I'm actually, these are things we've extracted from experience in our teaching and, and our research, but also in our, in our curriculum. Um, What's common that really says, this is what's really different, you know? There's a, everybody knows about the big maker movement that's going on now, and high schools have it, junior high schools have it, colleges have it. Everybody should learn how to make something. And you can go to a computer and draw something, you can 3D print it, you can laser cut it, you can do all these things. And it's great, it's giving everybody hands on. It's to make one thing. Um, how do you distinguish that from here? And, one of it is this continual flow of new material through processes in a system of processes, I have to read these carefully, uh, combining, as you said, bringing parts together, multiple supplier streams, creating a product with minimal variation, I think we all know why, and it costs a lot of money. You have to buy all this stuff to put through the factory, you have to have all this equipment. There aren't many other enterprises where you need to put that much capital at risk. And you better meet the customer demand or you're going to have a warehouse full of stuff that nobody wants. <clears throat> and in the end, you have to make money doing it. You can buy a lot of stuff, you can process it. Okay. That was true of the Quar factory, it was true of the Chevy factory, it's true of the, the Tesla factory. I don't know if they figured out that last part yet at Tesla, but they're working on it. Um, and um, nowadays, Variability of the demand of the time frame is, is just huge, huge, you know. You don't have long product cycles like we used to. So a lot of variability in, like you might say, in dimension, in quality, uh, and variation in time. So you, you, this is what, if I take those same words and just emphasize them, flow through systems with suppliers and variation, lots of capital, Demand, cost, highly variable. Just You see a theme here, variability, flow. Did I mention variability <laughs> and, and flow? So we kind of said, you know, if we're going to really try and really get at essence of things, maybe we, we could do something like this. So one is, you know, this idea of things flowing, and the other is of things varying, you know. They don't stay the same. I had to do that animation or something. <laughs> And then you sort of, that, that's, that is, that's more been extracted from what we do, but I think, it, it, I think it's, it's a good 
basis for our principles. And then the success factors. If you remember nothing else from tonight, flow <laughs> and variation. Yeah, flow and variation, but we actually have found over time that these, these, these next four things, which we call the big four, um, are a really good way to kind of assess anything you're doing in manufacturing, whether it's a technology, a system, or these principles. Um, only four for success, to measure your, your success or how you're doing. Can you think of one? Does somebody, does somebody want to buy it? Yeah, that would be demand, yeah. Cost, I heard cost, yeah. Productivity, repeatability. This quality. Time. We are pretty much got it, yeah, exactly. So here's what we do, quality, rate, cost, and here's, and this kind of gets to, does anybody want it? Flexibility, okay? So, I, and I kind of do this in, in that order because you could be making stuff really fast at low cost, but it's such junk that nobody wants it. You could be, have quality products made at the right rate at a low cost, uh, and nobody wants it because you've got the wrong product. Um, and as we saw, you, there are all these famous examples like when Apple, launches an iPhone and they can't make enough of them, the rate becomes a real problem. When Tesla launches a car, they can make, can't make enough of them and their quality problems, but they eventually get to it. Um, these are very interesting things uh, to measure against. And so <clears throat> my point is that when we think, for example, about 4.0 or 1.0 or 2.0, how do they uh, uh, affect all of these things? As we went through these technological stages, how did it we hope, improve these success factors. And we get at, uh, my point is as an academic, how, you know, how do we teach this and how do we get at it? Oh, the, I think we already know that. So um, this, is, this, is what, this is our curriculum that we used to kind of extract these principles. And we do it at really four levels. We do it at the process level, that's each machine, is it, is it how does it measure uh, on quality cost, uh, quality rate cost and flexibility at the process level? And we do it by, by studying and teaching how to model and understand flow and variation in a process. And by the way, that's a really fancy name for statistical process control and some other things. We also study, sorry, how things flow through a factory. This is one of the great revelations for me as a mechanical engineer who thought that a factory was a machine, a machine, just one. And then to have some of my colleagues studying what happens when you have a bunch of them together, their reentrant flows, like in a, in a um, semiconductor plant, um, they, they, one goes faster than the other, one of them breaks down, uh, one of them's doing good quality, one of them's not doing bad quality, and you've got a target to meet demand out here. Uh, very interesting, very interesting stuff. And then, believe it or not, this has been up until the, 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 certain, the current emphasis on things like AI and, and machine learning, supply chains have been one of the biggest topics because many, many companies realize that their ability to manage not just the inventory and materials inside their four walls, but outside, was as important as anything, as anything, and one could, without oversimplifying too much, say there's, there's Amazon, really understanding your supply chain. And then uh, uh, flow and variation in your organization and management, okay, driven by these things I've talked about. So um, let me just briefly give you an example of what I mean by these, uh, you know, so this is just, this is from a lab, but this is, this is what I mean by flow in a process. You're putting material in, you're, you're, this is an embossing, but you're putting it in, you're taking it out, you're putting it in, you're taking it out. Every one is an opportunity for variation. Um, so you can, you can, and this has been a classic thing, you cannot have good operating standards and so everybody does things a different way. You can have machines that are poorly maintained, that are not controlled well. Um, the big one is the material you bring in is different from day to day, even from hour to hour. Um, and good old natural variations. 
<clears throat> and then in a factory like this, um, this little simulation here is meant to show you what can happen if you're just happily processing through each of these squares and one of them stops working. And these buffers, which are holding the inventory, start to fill up and then all of a sudden the system stops and trying to model that in a probabilistic way turns out to be really important. And I would say that our students in our, in our professional manufacturing degree mainly come from mechanical engineering and a few other disciplines. This is completely new to them and one of the most powerful tools they end up uh, using. And I think you can understand that something like a system like this with actually a lot of different things going, and this is about the simplest you ever find. If I knew exactly what was going on there at all times, which is what 4.0 is about, I should be able to manage that system a lot better. And so that's one of the big impacts uh, that it's had. And then, uh, so variation in the factory system. And then the, the supply chain, and uh, I don't know if this diagram will work, but let's just try it. This is sort of the idea of a supply chain. I've got you know, a factory here feeding into this factory. I've got a, a factory here going into this warehouse, which then is trucked over to this factory. Another factory there is supplying nuts and bolts. Some of it comes by, by rapid, um, you know, by, by um, semi. This is coming by a ship. You're doing all these different timings and all that kind of stuff. Um, you finally get it to the last warehouse where it's shipped to the um, dealer and your happy customer drives away with the product. I don't know if you can see that, that but that's me. <laughs> um, what could possibly go wrong with that, right? <laughs> possibly, so yeah. Um, and this has become a field day for people who like to do large-scale optimization. So I want to use ships because they're cheaper and I can get much more on them. But that means, for example, if I'm in the fashion industry, by the time the ship gets to uh, uh, Europe from Asia, uh, the fashion season has changed. So I have to be able to predict and things like that. Or I can, I can put it on a, a transport plane, but I'm going to pay a lot more for it. You don't know exactly what the customer is going to want. There's uncertainty in the supply. Um, you're, you're depending on this logistics network. It, it gets quite complicated. So again, this becomes a really important thing to understand if you're going to have a successful manufacturing enterprise. And quite honestly, I think a lot of the decline in US manufacturing, we know it came because we weren't paying attention to these things. And let me tell you real quickly before I get to the last one, I just a, a quick aside. Um, and this is where I can bring in my history. I've been at MIT for 40 plus years. And about 25, 30 years ago, we started this thing called the Leaders for Manufacturing program. Anybody ever heard of this? Yeah, you've heard of it. Do you know why we did it? We were scared to death that the Japanese were going to completely take over manufacturing and didn't know what to do about it. We didn't know what to do at MIT, and major corporations in the US didn't know what to do. And so we started this program. They put a lot of money into it, and it's been a tremendous success. Now, it, now it's just about manufacturing excellence and, um, uh, and you know, has broadened. But it's had a big impact. Here's the thing. The first 10 years, or five to 10 years, what do you think we focused on? Think about Japan. Think about. Think Toyota, think Chevrolet. Quality, yeah. So it was all about quality. All of our projects and all of the research on quality. Then what came next? Think Toyota again. <laughs> Just in time. Just in time, lean manufacturing. That's the system. The first was the processes. This is the system, flowing things through the system. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, well, there's a longer discussion around just-in-time, and, and so it's more a matter of 
what, what lean manufacturing taught us is that running your factory really well was important. I'll just put it that way. Just in time was one of many things that were involved. And not a, not a panacea, doesn't always work for that very reason. Um, and in fact, I was in Japan once and they, there was some sort of a storm or something and it meant the trucks couldn't get to the factories on time. That can be a real problem. Um, then all of a sudden, what do you think the next, it's just now ending actually, what do you think the next big thing that that program focused on was? Processes, factories, yawn, Labor and supply, supply chain, yeah. I mean, unbelievable amount of work on supply chains. So these major corporations working with this program, which is a joint management engineering program, have kind of said, these are the things we kind of have to be excellent in to be world-class manufacturing. What do you think they're doing now? As the, yeah, they're, they're actually now, these, these management engineering students, which used to have to take statistics and quality classes and lean manufacturing, they still do, and, and, and supply chain, they all now must take a class in machine learning, data science and machine learning. So, these are the, you can follow these things and industry is telling us this is what's important. Okay, um, I think I'll just skip through this, but uh, I think we can argue that there's a, certainly a flow of capital through manufacturing organizations. Those are oil barrels there because there's a lot of resources required um, and all that stuff again comes out the other end with my car. But the other thing here is, which is very interesting and this, this would be again for another day, um, you start with some knowledge and it increases as you go through the factory, which is really something that's this kind of cool. I've actually uh, had a colleague, former digital executive who um, coined this term, the knowledge supply chain, which is kind of interesting. So manufacturing is actually a source of, it's a sink for knowledge because it wants new people in, but um, it's also a source for it. Okay, so uh, let, let me just conclude with a couple slides and then I want to get to a little uh, comment on workforce. But just to summarize, left-hand side, technology, the levels of technology. So when we had standardized parts and that sort of thing, I think you'd agree we had flow of materials through processes and systems. The, the, you know, the gun barrels and, and the stocks and other things were flowing through. The, you know, the raw materials were flowing through the mills here and textiles were coming out the other end. What about mass production? Same thing. How about automation? Same thing. How about cyber systems 4.0? It's, it's the same thing, okay? So that's how we can distinguish between technology and principles. That doesn't mean the technology isn't influencing how we apply the principles, that's the whole thing. But these principles and um, you know, we sort of say, why, why don't you learn these? Why, why is it important to learn these? I had a colleague, Stan Gershwin, who's your real authority in these manufacturing systems, and always pushing people, you can model what's flowing through a factory, you can understand it better. Lean manufacturing, all those things are great. The difference is, you can make decisions using data. He used to said, say, not assumptions. Uh, he said, you use data, not politics. It's not who can shout the loudest or who's the, you know, the most experienced. It's, this is why we should be doing these types of things. And so, and, and again, many of our students who learn these principles, they're heroes when they go out to the companies because they actually have a good reason for doing things that they're doing. Um, uh, it's the world-class standard now. All these top companies are doing it. It's, it's now well accepted. And um, <clears throat> the penetration isn't what it should be, but it should be done. And here's the key to tonight. I think it's fundamental to achieving 4.0. Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. But even if you're not even 4.0, if you're a 2.0 operation or a 3.0 or that 0.0 one that we saw in, in uh, India, um, these principles apply and could be used to improve what they're doing. So new technology without a basis in principle, lipstick on a pig, okay? <laughs> And again, it's extreme here, but I've seen so many cases going back to 3.0 where companies come in and say, we got a lousy factory, um, we need to get better, let's put in some robots. Or we have a lousy, you know, we're, we're having problems, um, we need to get better, let's, let's do 4.0.
that factory I mentioned in, in Kansas, um, uh, their original plan as it really originally presented to us was we're gonna automate like crazy and, and do 4.0. And in fact, they're still doing that but on a much uh, reduced scale because after we, we applied these principles, um, they, have, they have excess capacity, they don't do overtime anymore. It's, it's really quite remarkable. Okay, so who should learn these? Everybody, but um, certainly engineers entering the manufacturing positions, but we kind of unfortunately have the hypothesis that most people never really got this formal training. And I think it's characterized by a student we had early on in the program. Normally we get students that are just a couple of years out and they want to get into manufacturing. But uh, I was interviewing him and the guy had been out for 10 years and he was sort of reciting all these things, the principles. I said, well, I said, why do you want to come to MIT? He said, well, I know these things, but I can't teach them to anybody. I don't, I don't have the basis for them. I've kind of figured it out uh, through the school of hard knocks. Uh, so he came and did the degree and now I think he started his own company. He's doing quite well. Um, this is what's really important. It, you know, this is not for the big boys only. It's for the small and medium enterprises. But here's one that we're finding more and more. We're finding that startup companies are wanting to learn these principles because they realize that one of the key things that kills a startup is what's called the valley of death, you know, which is a transition from a nice bench up top idea to something you can actually produce in volume to make money and understanding simple things like quality and supply chain and other things really, really important and um, other things. This is the last one which I find really interesting and we're still looking at this. Is it important that everybody in the factory from, uh, you know, from the machine operators up through the manager know these principles? Absolutely, Absolutely. good, that's the answer I was looking for. Um, but, but, uh, but we're not ready to do that, but that's, that's the interesting thing. Um, that is not the slide I wanted, let's skip that one. That one's good too, but this one's much better. Here's the point though, and this really, you can see this just tracks what we're talking about. This is uh, Bureau of Labor data on changes in manufacturing employment over 12 years at the beginning of the, of the uh, uh, century. Um, big decrease, 25% decrease if you have a high school education. Decrease if you have high school but no college. With some college you break even, with a BA degree, you're doing great. If you have a graduate degree, you're doing really great. This is growth. These are not absolute numbers. It'd be, you know. But that tells you that the demands, this is the new reality in manufacturing. Um, so what I'm really saying is that the, all of these things here and the way to, to take care of that education is if you want to be an expert in cloud computing related to manufacturing, you study cloud computing and these. If you really want to do augmented reality to help with training and machine operation and all these kinds of things, do that and these. If you're working on autonomous robots, this is a big one. Do that and do these. Additive manufacturing, we did an additive manufacturing class a few years ago. It did something really striking with it. We had the students say, go out and make some parts and measure how good they are and make more than one of them. And you know, this was like, oh yeah, what about that? So, so <laughs> this is, this is, our, this is our, our sort of our hypothesis here. Yes, go to town here. Be an expert in any one of these. Big data is another one. We have, we have everybody going off and now doing um, machine learning and, and <clears throat> data science. If they would just take time out to learn these, I think they'd have a huge impact. Okay, so um, let me just have a quick conclusion, um, which is this, and, and these are some broad statements. This vision that of 4.0, and it's realized in many, many factories these days, is a factory is now this really highly interconnected, connected, uh, um, high-speed, complex technical system. Even, even this, again, this small factory in Kansas had a lot of technology in there, all connected, very complex technical system. And what's unique about it are these principles, the flow and the variation, <laughs> um, 
and quality, rate, cost, and flexibility. Okay, so uh, that is something that you don't ever want to forget about, and that's what you need to understand. Remember that the highest growth area right now is in the area of advanced degrees, but we are now convinced, especially with some of the experience we've had and working with some major industrial training uh, agencies, that is what you really need to do is have the whole workforce, top to bottom, be aware of these. Granted, at different levels, what you teach an engineer about the principles would be different than what you teach an, a machine operator, a, a machine technician, a local manager, or a global manager. Um, and we must embrace digitalization completely, but not put lipstick on a pig. Okay, thank you very much. I may have worn you out, but if you have questions, I'd love to uh, address them. You never said anything about actually designing before you do anything. So you design oh, you're, ta you're talking about designing products? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, what would you like me to say about it? <laughs> um, so uh, that's a very good point. And another, another revelation we had back when we started this Leaders for Manufacturing program is we learned the term transom engineering. Anybody ever heard this term? Yeah, you design it, throw it over the door, you never open the door, manufacturing gets it and they have to make it. So another, another lesson learned here is, and, and 4.0 does help this, the communication between those dreaming up the designs and those executing them is much better. Um, I could have also said, and I didn't put it on my list here, but we, we actually um, have said a lot about this. If you're a designer and you don't appreciate these issues, I mean, these manufacturing issues, um, again, you, you're, you're missing a big part of your design space, your, your design constraints. So we are advocating again that, in fact, our, our Master of Engineering in Manufacturing degree was recently renamed to the Master of Advanced Manufacturing and Design degree because we realized that, in fact, a good part of what we did related to design, and we have design classes as well. But our students who come in with a strong design interest still have to take the principles uh, of manufacturing. Yeah, Kim. So um, the attributes that you pointed out as being in common across um, uh, 1.0, 2.0, um, um, the uh, flows of materials yeah. and processes and systems yep. that you described as being characteristic of manufacturing, I just wanted to say they're characteristic of a much wider field, so the human body could be described exactly the same way, flows of materials through systems and processes. <laughs> and a farm could be described the same oh, way. Oh, well, a farm is a factory, but yeah. It could be described the same way. Yeah. So yeah. it's a little misleading to present those as being attributes of manufacturing or the attributes of so many other things besides. Well, I, I would agree with you in the sense that, that um, those two terms of flow and, and, and variation apply to a lot of things. I'm applying them to this thing called the manufacturing enterprise as opposed to, um, uh, it's a technical enterprise, as opposed to some other technical enterprise that, um, like, like prototyping or, or design, um, is, is applied to. Um, your farming example, by the way, a lot of the statistics and other systems things that we have here actually came from agricultural research years and years ago. On the body and the earth, I mean, my only thing I would say there is that having actually once done biomedical research, I went into manufacturing because I got tired of not being able to change things in the body. <laughs> and once I, uh, you know, I couldn't make this machine, I could do a prosthesis on, but I couldn't make this machine, but I could make that machine and I could, I could vary how I do my, yep. my, do my, uh, my agriculture, but very good point. Yeah. Roll to roll? Well, you know, actually, um, I, have a, I have a small credential in roll to roll. Um, 
and I don't do it anymore. <laughs> because roll-to-roll um, -roll manufacturing, you know, you can imagine um, you, can, you can roll textiles, you can roll paper, you can roll films, you can do many, many things, and you can make um, lots of product very rapidly this way. But it's, 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 again, it's another technology that can be very, very helpful. Um, it's an old technology. We've been doing it for, for 100 years. Sensors, controls, and other things have greatly improved what it's doing. By the way, the most computerized factory I've ever seen in my life was the Alcoa factory in Alcoa, Tennessee that makes aluminum for beer cans because to, to do it at the quality, cost, and rate that you needed, and these enormous machines were doing that. So roll-to-roll -roll is, is, is a big thing. I did some work on printed electronics. It's coming a long way. Could we do it really fast? There was um, a startup called Karnarka down in New Bedford, actually in Lowell, and, and then down in an old Polaroid facility in <clears throat> New Bedford that could make solar cells that rolled up on a roll about this fast. And that was pretty cool. It was amazing. You know why you can't buy a Canarca solar cell? They didn't work very well. <laughs> they worked pretty well, but they had some problems. But I don't know if that, if that got to your question, but roll to roll is, is a, particularly in, in the area of electronics, in other active devices and other things that that is, is very, very important. And it's, it's governed a lot by our ability to now um, control things really, really well for, for not too much expense. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, what about manufacturing five points? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I was just thinking of things like, like zero gravity like, you know, systems operating yeah. in an environment you know, that's, that's completely different. Yeah. That type of but do you have any speculation? Uh, only thing I can tell you about, uh, here, I have a slide on that. The only thing I can tell you about 5.0 is that, where'd it go? Uh, yes, <laughs> this will still be true. <laughs> no, um, we, we've been, we, we're joking because, uh, you know, as I said, it's, it's just a progression. And um, I do believe, as with all of these, you know, why did we get to automation? Well, there were some breakthroughs that actually had to do with stuff like developments uh, from World War II that led to servo mechanisms that, and CNC machines, or NC machines lead, led to some basic computer programming and, and, you know, all these things happen. I do believe that, that it is this evolutionary improvement in the cost and, and quality and utility of information systems that's done the latest one. Um, I don't know, someone brought up the um, Star Trek materializer machine, you know, maybe that would be the next one. I did see, by the way, just the other day, <clears throat> um, former student of ours is at Berkeley who has invented this process and the demonstration of this, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but you know a lot of uh, 3D printing is stereolithography where you shine, or a single beam, you shine it on the surface of a polymer that, that solidifies when you hit it with the light. He, took, uh, he takes a beaker of this same material and spins it, and then using com uh, uh, computer tomography, he irradiates it with the right wavelengths, and it spins around for about a minute or two, and I mean, it's, it's a miracle, all of a sudden, a three, day, a three a, a detailed three-dimensional object appears in the middle. So it's it's like volume 3D printing. It's not, it's it's uh, almost not like additive manufacturing. It's like, boo, look at that. So things like that are happening, and that's what's really exciting. But I would see that more as a progression right now. I, I'm not a good enough prognosticator. I thought we were never going to have a gigabyte of memory. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, Frederick Taylor, yeah. The central principle of Taylor was remove all brain work from the shop. Right. right. The essential feature of lean or the Toyota production system is put the brain work back on the shop. That's right. Get people working in teams. That's right. And control variation at the point of the shop floor. That's right. Production. That's right. So 
people who work in a Chevrolet factory in Framingham could never influence variation, whereas someone working in a Toyota factory... They can pull the cord and say, stop, something's stop wrong. The yeah. Line. yeah. In fact, they're expected to do that. <clears throat> That's right. Where is the brain work in 4.0? <laughs> it's in the cloud. <laughs> I mean, it's obviously in the code, but I, yeah. I mean, I'm really thinking about the actual manufacturing process. No, I think, I, I think that's Where a... Is the brain yeah. Well, it's a, it's a good question, and again, we're, we're getting at this because we have thought about how would we bring these principles to someone at the shop floor level, and why would they need to know them? And our, our hypothesis is that they could exploit the 4.0 technology better if they knew what it was being used for and why. Um, well, I'll give you a quick example, though. Again, back to this, uh, it was a great trip to this, this shop in, in Kansas. Um, they had put in a cobot. Does anybody know what a cobot is? A collaborative robot? It's just a robot, but it's one that um, has, has very soft mov movements and one that gives if it hits things and that sort of thing. So they had put one in to load and unload this machine because it was really heavy stuff to put in there. And they had the guy from the robot fact, uh, vendor there, and it was all great. But I tell you, the only people who really knew what was going on in there were the machinists. And they, they just happened to be really knowledgeable guys. They were up on the technology. So I think actually, you know, it, it, who knows about displacing the actual um, uh, uh, number of workers? I'm not so sure about that. If this is about doing it better, and, and stepping back. For example, at my, my interest, which is at the process level, having much better process data, being able to understand what quality problems are before they come along, um, maybe putting more controls in place to replace something that a, a, um, an operator might have done by measuring and thinking, uh, you know, thinking out new solutions and that sort of thing. Um, but I think, I think it's a really good point. I do think that the brain is here to stay as that, you know, um, I, just as an aside once, I, I heard not that many years ago, at least for both socioeconomic reasons and technical reasons, that there was an auto plant. Um, one of the Detroit plants had a plant over in Windsor, Canada. They were hiring degreed engineers to run machines and things on the factories because they're getting ridiculously sophisticated and expensive. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, 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 really yeah. Soon, yeah. Yeah. But it fits most of your well, they certainly have variation and and <laughs> rates. Yeah. I, I I I couldn't venture a guess on that. Um, they they are, um, you know, we talked about converting one thing into another thing and adding value. You could say yeah, they convert usually a fuel into a valuable commodity called uh, yeah. You could call them a commodity producer. Yeah. And more and more, we don't want to run them the same the whole time. You know, the ability to follow is really important, and putting in storage is getting more important. Yeah. And yeah. The supply chain. Yeah. Which we're feeling here in New England. Yeah. Restrictions on gas pipelines. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the ability to get the resource in and out, getting a good grid. Yep. Yep. I didn't know my principles were this universal. I can I can tell everybody now they they describe the earth. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much for that. Yes, sir. What are the needed uh, changes in behavior or equipment for electric vehicles to really make a uh, mm. substantial immediate Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I mean, I, I, I'm going to speculate on this. I have a little bit of content knowledge. I, um, I love to say this, I drove up in my, in my nice new Tesla Model 3, and some of my students were actually on the quality team that made sure the doors closed and things like that, so I'm really psyched about it. Um, <clears throat> but, um, I, I, you know, I don't know how relevant this is tonight, because one of the things, well, there is a relevant thing. You may have heard the story that the delays in delivering that particular one were because I don't know if I want to say this because we're taping this, but, but um, there was a little bit of the lipstick on the pig problem. In other words, they decided to blast the factory with technology 
beyond what was really necessary for, at that time to get the task out. It, it still takes time to do it. They're catching up now and, and learning. Um, but with respect to electric technology, I think my, my opinion is that is still primarily a, a fundamental technology issue. It's, it, as we all know, the key thing with the car is the battery. Uh, Tesla and others have, have now, you know, they have their famous Gigafactory. They have tremendous manufacturing capabilities, so they're really um, doing a great job with those cells, probably making them as well and as cheaply as anybody could, but they still cost too much to, uh, to put together. Um, but I think um, what, what, I, what I really like about Tesla, I also had a Chevy Volt for a while, is they're, they're really well made and the manufacturing seems to be superb and that only helps. So at least you can say, well, that's not the issue. It's not that we're bad at making it. It's that it just has an inherent um, cost associated with it. So it's the battery cost? I think, you know, I, I, that's, what, that's what the battery people tell me and that's what, it, you know, um, <clears throat> all you have to do is, if I suggest you do this sometime, go on the Tesla website and say, I want your cheapest one. And then they say, yeah, but w would you like 100 miles more range? I say, sure. And they'll say, okay, $9,000. You go, oh, well, maybe, maybe. <laughs> it's not quite that bad anymore. But yeah, that, that's still, when you look at the difference uh, in cost, that's the driver. That's the driver, yeah. But we're getting there. And everybody should have one. They're the best things in the world. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you all very much. Great questions. Thanks for your attention.